As Matt mentioned, we are studying morality this semester, and we're starting with metaethics. Now, most people are used to the idea of, of ethics, right? So when we have conversations about ethics, we're talking usually about various things and whether they're uh, good or bad, right? Is the death penalty good or bad? Is abortion good or bad? But before we dive into some of those ethical topics, we wanted to spend a few weeks talking about meta-ethics first. And meta-ethics, if you're new to this conversation, is more about what makes something right or wrong in the first place. So meta-ethics is, is a more foundational conversation before we get to topics, um, particular ethic topics in ethics. Last week, for those of you who weren't, weren't here, what we did is we looked at the two major theistic theories of meta-ethics. Now, pretty much all theists, Christians and other type of theists, affirm that God is the source and foundation of morality. But even among theists, even among Christians, there's disagreements as to how God serves as the foundation and source of morality. So we looked at the two major positions in theistic meta-ethics. We looked at natural law theory and divine command theory. There's other theories out there, but like most things, uh, these are the two main theories, okay? As I mentioned last week, every moral theory, every meta-ethical theory is trying to explain at least two things. But these are the, the two big things that every meta-ethical theory is trying to explain. First of all, they're trying to explain moral value. And that simply is uh, what makes something good or bad. And the second thing they're trying to explain is similar and related, but distinct, and that is moral obligation. Sometimes this is referred to as moral duties. This has more to do with the shoulds, right? We should do this. We should not do that. So even if something is a good thing to do, right, let's say pretty much everybody agrees that uh, protecting an innocent person from a murder is a good thing to do, right? We can have that conversation. We agree it's a good thing. But a separate topic would be, well, why should we do something that's good? You might just think to yourself, well, isn't it obvious if it's a good thing we should do it? But do you see how there's just a little bit of a distinction there? Even though we agree it's a good thing, there has to be something additional that causes us or makes us obligated to do it. Even if it's good, why should we do something that's good? Now, we ended last week looking at Robert Adams' theory. His book, Finite and Infinite Goods, has really become a modern classic. It's well-respected. Robert Adams has been a philosophy professor at many um, well-known schools, including uh, Yale University. I think he spent most of his time as a professor at Yale University. But Robert Adams is very well respected, both him and his wife, who's passed away, were both Christians. And his Christian meta-ethical theory is very well laid out in his book, uh, Finite and Infinite Goods. And he would affirm a divine command theory of moral obligation. So as we talked about last week, he would affirm that our obligations come from divine commands. Now, remember, in this context, we're using the word command not to refer just to direct verbal instructions from God, but command in this context means any way, um, all the ways that God makes His uh, will known to us or makes our moral obligations known to us. So it can be intuition, it can be our conscience, it can be moral reasoning. There's all sorts of ways and direct verbal commands like we normally think about when we hear the term command, like the Ten Commandments. So he had a um, divine command theory of moral obligation, but we didn't talk about his theory of moral value. So again, just explaining Robert Adams' theory, his position on moral value is that something is good, uh, an action that I would do as a human being would be good, morally good, if it resembled God's moral nature. 
So God, in this theory that he's proposing, is the ultimate standard of good. And so if something resembles him or images him or reflects him in the morally pertinent way, then it is morally good. And if it doesn't resemble God's moral nature, then it's morally bad. So, uh, last week I had lined up, but we didn't have time to go through it. I wanted to defend his position here because I happen to agree with it. My theory is very, very similar to Robert Adams. In fact, there's a sense in which my theory is just built on top of or on the foundation of Robert Adams' theory, which works out well because his last name is my first name, so it makes sense, right? So, um, I also don't want to take the time to defend it this week, but I'll do it really quickly, okay? And the way I'm going to defend it, one of the ways I was going to defend it, was just to show you all the other folks throughout history that have affirmed and argued for this theory of moral value. That what is good is what resembles God. He's not the first one to have this idea. He's just the most recent who has articulated and developed the theory uh, very in-depthly most recently. So this theory can be found even in many of the ancient Greek philosophers. And I'm not going to take the time to read these. Unfortunately, if you want them, email me and I'll give them all to you. But for the purpose of the YouTube video, people can pause and then read it at your leisure. But Socrates um, argued for a similar idea. Plato had a similar idea. Aristotle also seemed to affirm that what is morally good is that is that which resembles God. The Bible, um, certainly, here's Aristotle, we did Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. I think um, the Bible clearly teaches that what is good is that which reflects God. So Jesus talks about being perfect. Uh, we should be perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect. All throughout the New Testament, I have verses here from Paul, uh, verses from John, all talking about this idea that we should image God, we should reflect God. He's the standard, and we're good if we're like Him. I mean, just, as, just think of all the verses that talk about being godly. Just in that term, it's implying this theory. Being godly is being good because you're being like God. Christian theologians throughout history have affirmed this idea, so you find this in uh, Augustine. You find it in all the big A's. Anselm seemed to argue for this. Uh, John Calvin, Aquinas, one more A. Aquinas seemed to argue for this view. John Calvin, one of the reformers. And then other contemporary Christians, other contemporary Christian philosophers besides Robert Adams all seem to affirm this idea that to be morally good is to resemble God. So that's their theory of moral value. Here we have William Alston and then the last one, Mark Murphy. And I know that was just a quick breeze through, but all that to say this idea of moral value being that which resembles God is not new and it's not unique to Robert Adams, um, but he's just a very good modern contemporary proponent of the idea. And it's very well respected. So even um, Eric Wielenberg, when he writes against uh, theistic metaethics as an atheist, he's arguing against theistic metaethics, he will often use Robert Adams' theory as the one to fight with because it's, as he, as Wielenberg sees, it's, it's the best or one of the best theistic theories. All right, but let's move on from Robert Adams' theory to my theory. Um, as I mentioned, my meta-ethical theory is most similar of all the meta-ethical theories that are out there. Mine is most similar to Robert Adams, but I have one big difference. So the big difference in my theory compared to Adams is that I argue that the source and foundation of morality is God's Trinitarian nature. So I'm still, you know, referring to God as the source and foundation of morality. Resembling Him is what 
make something be morally good, but it's in particular the loving relationships between the members of the Trinity. So those, that communion of loving fellowship between those three divine members is the source and foundation of morality. So something is good if it reflects those loving relationships, and it's bad if it doesn't reflect those loving relationships. Now those of you that are new maybe to Christianity or aren't Christians yourself, the Trinity might be something that's um, strange or odd or mysterious, and even to a lot of Christians it can be mysterious. But tonight I'm just affirming the basic Christian view of the Trinity, simply that God is one being, but He exists as three persons. It seems strange to us because we're not used to that. We're used to one being and one person, right? I'm one human being, right? And I'm also one person. I'm Adam Johnson. But it doesn't seem too far-fetched to say that there is a, a being, not a human being, but a being, one being. And instead of being one person, uh, he is three persons. It's odd because we're not used to that. We're used to one being and one person. But that's what Christians affirm. That's what they affirm the Bible teaches about God, that He's one being and three persons. So when it comes to these two parts then, every meta-ethical theory is trying to explain these, these two things. So my meta-ethical theory, this is how I would summarize it. Moral value, what makes something good or bad? Well, it's a good if it resembles the love between the members of the Trinity. Bad if it doesn't. Moral obligation, I would affirm, you know, sort of a divine command theory with some caveats and maybe a, a Trinitarian twist to it, okay? So I'm affirming divine command theory as a theory of obligation, but bringing in the Trinity, which you'll see how I do tonight to make it a very Trinitarian understanding of divine command theory. Now, I don't call my meta-ethical theory divine command theory because I find that that term causes way too much confusion. Um, just the name implies that commands are the most important thing in your theory, divine command theory. That's the first thing you think about is commands. But divine commands is not the most important thing in my theory. The Trinity is. So I don't want to cause that confusion by calling it a divine command theory. So I call it a Trinitarian moral theory, sometimes a Trinitarian meta-ethical theory, if I'm trying to really impress people. But Trinitarian moral theory, sometimes I'll refer to it as TMT. But in fact, maybe you guys can help me with this. I'm looking for a word that starts with N that I could squeeze into my title there <laughs> so it could be the TMNT theory. So if you guys can come up with a good word that starts with N, let me know. <laughs> All right, well, if you're new to Rosh Christie, what we like to do every so often is to get me to stop talking and allow you guys to discuss uh, a good word that starts with N. <laughs> no, here's what I want you to talk about. Um, since my theory is built on the idea of the Trinity, I want you guys to discuss that um, for a second. I just kind of threw out a very simple, basic Christian understanding of the Trinity. But I want you guys to discuss it and maybe answer anybody's questions if somebody's new to this idea. And a lot of people will accuse Christians that their idea of a trinity doesn't make any sense. So talk about that. Break up into small groups. You guys can split into two back there. Maybe a couple groups in here. You guys can take a break, do a battery check on uh, the equipment. And we'll, uh, we'll discuss this for just a few minutes. So I struggled with trying to uh, structure the material tonight as a teacher or as a presenter. You know, it's always nice if, you've ha if you have some sort of an outline or some sort of a structure through which you're presenting the material. So it's not just, you know, fact after fact after fact. And the best way that I thought of to do that tonight is to give you the top five reasons to believe that my theory is true. <laughs> right. So the reason I'm doing that is because, as in most things, whenever we have theories, whether they're scientific theories or ethical theories, the way that you judge them or the way that you try to 
ascertain whether those theories are true or not is if you see um, if they fit the data, right? You see how uh, strong their explanatory power is. Are they able to explain things well? Do they explain the data that you see? Um, whether it's a scientific theory or an ethical theory or whatever we're trying to theorize about, does the theory fit the data well? And so that's what I'm asking about my theory, and so I'll be making a case for my theory that, yes, in fact, it does fit the data that we have very well, and, that we, and that's how we would test a theory like this. Does it fit the data? And the data that I'm referring to is data both from God's general revelation, you know, that He reveals things to us generally, and His special revelation. So I'm not going to make a case that God exists, that the Bible is from God. We've done that before. I'm assuming that I've already made that argument so that I can use the Bible as part of my data to build my theory. So both information from general revelation and special revelation is what I use to build my theory, and I try to make my theory, my theory fit the data, and I think it does, and that's what I'm going to be trying to make a case for tonight. Okay. So you've probably read already, here are the five reasons, and we'll just go through them. And the first one is the Trinity is a key aspect of God, if not the key aspect of God. And so it makes sense that morality would be based on this key aspect of God. So here's a quote from a guy, John Zazulis is my best guess on how to pronounce his last name. But he wrote that love is not an emanation or property of the substance of God, but is constitutive of his substance. In other words, love is that which makes God what he is, the one God. Thus, love is not a qualifying, a secondary property of being, but it becomes the supreme ontological predicate. That's why Scripture talks in those terms as well, that God is love. And it's part and parcel of the Trinitarian love between the Father, Son, and the Spirit, that eternal community of loving fellowship between those three. Alan Torrance wrote, there's no reason why we should not conceive of the intra-divine communion of the Trinity as the ground of all that is. So, a lot, for a lot of Christian theologians, the Trinity just is the main um, aspect of God. He's Trinitarian, first and foremost, before anything else. More contemporary uh, evangelical theologian, while he was explaining these loving relationships in the Trinity, theologian Millard, Millard Erickson described this love in the Trinity as the attractive force of unselfish concern for another person, and thus the most powerful binding force in the universe. Now, this is more than just mere sentiment, okay? I mean, this would be nice on a Hallmark card, right? But it's more than a mere sent sentiment that love is the most powerful binding force in the universe. Because if God really does exist as three persons in loving relationship, if that is the case, if that's what is ultimate reality, then love is, love just is the basic fabric of reality. If God exists as a loving communion of three divine persons. So sometimes people will ask me, well, isn't it, enough just to say that morality is based on God's nature. That's kind of what Robert Adams said. That's what a lot of these previous theologians and even Greek philosophers said, that morality is just based on God's nature. Isn't that sufficient? And my answer is no, <laughs> of course. I want to go further and dive down into exactly what it is about God's nature that causes Him to be the source and foundation of morality. So just merely saying that it's based on God's nature, I don't think, paints the entire picture, okay? I think the picture is richer than that. 
Because if you leave out the dynamic, loving, Trinitarian relationships, it ignores the important relational aspects of God that's so helpful in understanding love and morality. In other words, by including these loving relationships in our understanding of morality, it provides a more complete picture of how God is the source and foundation of morality, and it helps resolve various problems and puzzles in metaethics. Okay? So just basing morality on God's nature isn't the complete picture. If you bring in the Trinitarian loving relationships, if you base it on God's Trinitarian nature, it clears up a lot of issues and makes it more of a, uh, a fuller picture of reality. So I'm making the case for. So here's a long quote, but I think it's very, very useful. This comes from a guy by the name of Norris Clark, but I think he sums it up really well. I'll read it. It's long. Don't be scared. Clark wrote, to be a person is to be with to be a sharer, a receiver, a lover. Ultimately, the reason why all this is so is that this is the very nature of the supreme being, God, the source of all being, as revealed to us in the Christian doctrine of God as three persons within the unity of one being, like I said before, so that the very being of God is, is to be self-communicative love. This dynamism within God is then echoed in all of us, his creatures, and in a preeminent way, in created persons, human persons, made in His image. Thus, the Christian revelation of the Trinity is not some abstruse doctrine for theologians alone, but has a unique illuminating power as to the meaning of being itself, which carries metaphysical vision beyond what was accessible to it unaided. This is Christian philosophy at its most fruitful. So yeah, you take people like Aristotle, Plato, Socrates, and from general revelation, they could make out, you know, maybe how God was the source and foundation of morality. But when God reveals directly to us these truths about himself, that he's a trinity of three persons, then that gives us that much more data to more fully understand how God is the source and foundation of morality. All right, let's move on to number two. Uh, I'm arguing that my theory is, is true, describes reality accurately, correctly, uh, because it explains why the meaning of life is our personal loving relationships. I think is, this is something that we all know intuitively from general revelation, right? That our loving relationships are the most important parts of our lives, the most important part of our life. Now, our loving relationships change over the years. When we're younger, they're our parents. When we're older, they become our friends, our siblings. Later, you know, we have boyfriend, girlfriend, and get married, then our children, then our grandchildren. So our loving relationships change throughout our life, but virtually everybody on their deathbed acknowledges that the most important thing in their life were their loving relationships, that they are the very purpose of our existence. And so the Trinitarian moral theory explains why that is. According to my theory, we were created to join the loving fellowship of the Trinity. We were created in His image as persons to expand the loving fellowship of the Trinity. So three persons in loving fellowship and then we were created to be a part of that fellowship, to expand that fellowship. So what I'm saying is the ultimate purpose for humans is basically to love God and to love others. That's what we are created for. That is our purpose, our telos, if you will, to love God and love others. And this resembles God. So loving God images Him. When we love God and we love other people, we are reflecting Him because in the Trinity, He is loving God, each other, the divine persons, and He's loving others, the three members loving each other. So loving God and loving others, when we do that, that's what we were created for, and when we do it, we image Him, we reflect Him. So a couple quotes here 
First one is from William Lane Craig. He explained that existing alone in the self-sufficiency of his own being, enjoying the timeless fullness of the intra-Trinitarian love relationships, God had no need for the creation of us, a finite persons, but he did this not because of a deficit in himself. He wasn't lonely, right? There's three divine persons in loving relationship from all eternity past. So he did this not out of a deficit in himself or his mode of existence, but in order that finite temporal creatures might come to share in the joy and blessedness of the inner life of God. Now, a huge resource for me, and I'm sitting on you know, the shoulder of giants as I'm trying to put together my theory, but a huge resource to me was a gentleman by the name of John Hare. He's currently a professor at uh, Yale University. And John Hare is a very strong advocate, contemporary proponent of Dun Scotus's work. Dun Scotus was um, more of a medieval era Christian theologian. But take a look at this quote from John Hare explaining Dun Scotus's theological insight. So this is Hare explaining Scotus's thought. He wrote that the journey that we are on as humans is a journey towards our final, our final good, our final purpose, which Dun Scotus takes to be that we become co-lovers of God. I'm not even going to try to pronounce that word entering into the love that the three persons of the Trinity have for each other. That's our very purpose, is to join that Trinitarian fellowship. Now, when it comes to special revelation, when it comes to Scripture, I think this is most clearly seen in John 17. And I've got a whole sermon that I do on John 17 where I try to flesh this out, and I'm not going to do that tonight. But John 17 would be where in special revelation in Scripture, where I think both I and John Hare and Dun Scotus are all gleaning this from. So we haven't necessarily come up with these ideas ourselves. We have you know, gotten them from, in particular, John 17. But you can read through that and, or pause, and take a look at these verses, or grab your Bible and look at John 17, pause it. But here in John 17, Jesus is praying to the Father, and he talks about their loving relationship before the foundation of the world, how he wants the disciples to experience that, and he wants his disciples to be a part of that, to be one like he and the Father are one. He wants the disciples to be a part of that as well, and us too. But in the context of this prayer, he's talking about the disciples that he's there, that are there with him. So there's a sense in which salvation then, you know, as much as Christians talk about the importance of salvation, the importance of the gospel, being a gospel-centered church, all, on, on, and on, that all that terminology is fine. But there's a sense in which, you know, the gospel and salvation is ultimately merely God's plan to restore us back to this, to restore us back to what we are intended to be in the first place, and that is uh, co-lovers or part of that loving communion fellowship of the Trinity. So that's what we were created to be. We've you know, broken uh, that relationship and fallen out of that relationship, and then the gospel is to restore us. Salvation is to restore us back to that right communion or that right relationship with God that we were initially created for. So I'm going to give you a couple theologians um, commenting on John 17. The first one here is Vern Poitras. Talking about John 17, he clarified that, you know, we humans, it's not as though we become divine ourselves. When we, you know, join the fellowship of the Trinity, we don't become divine. But the fellowship that we have with the Father and the Son is analogous to that exalted and perfect fellowship that the Father and Son have with each other. One of my uh, professors at seminary, Keith Whitfield, wrote in his book that Jesus, as the beloved Son of the Father, came to allow us to participate in the love that He has with His Father by the power of the Spirit. And then the last one here, just a uh, quote about John 17 from Royce Grunler, 
he noted of this chapter, John 17, that Jesus' prayer here reveals that the goal of the divine family, Father, Son, and Spirit, is to bring the separated and fallen back into a redeemed and unified family that reflects the relationship of the divine persons in their ultimate oneness. So let me take a break again, and I'll have you guys discuss this question. All right? If you were going to summarize the gospel in these Trinitarian terms, how would you do it? How would you explain or summarize the plan of salvation in a Trinitarian sense? And stumble through it, think through it. This might be the first time that you're thinking of salvation in a Trinitarian sense. So think out loud, you know, help one another to go through this. But let me give you a few minutes and you guys can discuss this in small groups. <laughs> If, uh, if I was going to try to summarize the gospel in a, a, in a Trinitarian sense, right, and I'm talking here when I'm using the term gospel, I'm meaning just basically the plan of salvation. Um, Christians also often talk about, you know, the gospel is how we can get reconciled with God. But if I summarize that in a Trinitarian sense, basically I, I start out with our, what our purpose is. We were created to be in communion. You know, God exists as a communion of love. We were created to join that communion. By our disobedience, uh, we broke that communion, right? And so God has come up with a way, if you want to put it that way. He has orchestrated a plan for us to be restored back to the communion of love that He created us for. And the way He did that was by sending, you know, Jesus to die on a cross for our sins and has promised us that anyone who would trust, put their faith in what Jesus did for them, would be restored uh, back to that communion, restored back to a right relationship with God. So it's not very complicated, it's, it's simple. It just adds the Trinitarian background to the basic gospel explanation, that God exists as a communion of love. We are created to be a part of that communion. That communion was broken because of our evil choices but we can be restored back to that communion of love in the Trinity through faith in Christ, through faith, putting our trust in what Christ did for us. That would be a Trinitarian summary of the gospel, of the plan of salvation. So let's move on to number three. Uh, I'm making the case that my meta-ethical theory, the Trinitarian moral theory, is true because it explains how we can be morally good by resembling God. As I said, um, love is the basis of morality. And love originates um, most primordially, the, the ultimate source of love is God's inner life of those loving relationships between the members of the Trinity. And as I've said, a human action then is good when it resembles that love. Now, one of the pushbacks, right, to my theory would be, well, we're so different from God. Maybe some of you have already thought this, and I don't blame you. It's one of the first thoughts that I had, too, when I was thinking through this theory. We're so different from God as human beings. He's a divine being, the only divine being, and we are human beings. How could we ever resemble Him? So take two simple examples, right? The first example is uh, a human being protecting an innocent person from a murderer. Most everybody would agree that this is a good thing to do. The second example would be a bad thing. Um, a human being murdering an innocent person. And you might think, somebody who's objecting to my theory might say, well, how could that, those two things resemble or not resemble the divine loving relationships? First of all, because you know, the divine persons can't even die. So it just seems like there's so much of a difference between us and the divine persons that resembling the divine persons doesn't seem to be uh, even something that we can do because we're so different. Well, here's how I would explain, okay? Because of the way that God created human nature, because of the way that God created us to be human beings, 
Protecting an innocent person from a murderer is a loving thing to do. The opposite is true of murdering an innocent person. Because of the way that God created us as humans, because of the way he created human nature, murdering an innocent person is an unloving thing to do. So the point that I'm trying to make in my theory, what I'm trying, what I'm trying to make a case for is that when you do something that's loving, that resembles the loving relationships in the Trinity and thus it's morally good. So it's not protecting the innocent, per se, that resembles the Trinitarian relationships, because, you know, the divine persons don't need protection. That's not what resembles. But it's the loving aspect of the action that resembles the love in the Trinitarian relationships. The reason why human nature plays such an important part here is that God could have made human nature differently. We've talked about these silly thought experiments, right? So if God would have created human beings to um, feel a lot of pleasure when they die and then come back to life 10 seconds later, then murder would be a loving thing to do. I know it's a silly thought experiment, but you know God could have created human nature to be that way. And then murder would be loving so it's the and then it would be morally good so it's the loving or unloving aspect of an action is what can resemble or not resemble god so in this way i think you know the natural law theorist is hitting on something correct remember we talked about natural law theory last week and i disagreed with it as an overall meta-ethical theory but i think they're affirming something correct here the importance of human nature. So facts about human nature, the way that God created us, and facts about the relationship between the members of the Trinity, those two facts work together to determine what's morally good and bad. Now this isn't natural law theory, right? I'll try to explain the difference between natural law theory and my theory, but they're both affirming the importance of human nature, the way that God made us. Here I'm trying to splice out the difference between natural law theory and my Trinitarian moral theory. So to answer the question, why is murder bad? A natural law theorist would say, well, it's bad because it doesn't lead to the fear flourishing of human nature. And I would reject that theory. I would say that, no, murder is bad because God created human nature in such a way that murdering is an unloving thing to do. He could have made us, you know, silly thought experiment in such a way that murder was a loving thing to do, but he didn't. But it's the loving or the unloving aspect of it that resembles God or doesn't resemble God. And I'm talking about the loving relationships between the members of the Trinity here. So even though I'm affirming you know, the importance of human nature, the importance role, the important role that it plays in morality, I'm not basing uh, morality on human nature, though it does play an important role. Now sometimes in this converse conversation, you know, we get to thinking so much and talking so much about love, maybe we should just stop for a moment and define what love is. If love is the ultimate basis, the loving relationships between the members of the Trinity, if that's the ultimate basis of what's good or bad, you know, maybe we should take a moment and just make sure we understand what we mean when we say the love. Um, murder is an unloving thing to do. There's love between the members of the Trinity. What do we mean by love here? I don't think this is too difficult. I think we all have a pretty strong intuitive understanding of what love is. I don't think it needs to be uh, thoroughly detailed and explained. I think we all have a pretty strong intuitive grasp about love. But if we want to go down this path for a little while, you know, we can look at several verses in special revelation from God, uh, him explaining what love is. The classic one, of course, is from 1 Corinthians 13, 
Love is patient, kind, not jealous, doesn't brag, not arrogant, not unbecomingly. I think this is one of the key aspects of love, that it doesn't seek its own. It's not selfish. So, you know, one of the core concepts of love, and I think this has played out really, really well in Philippians 2, is that love is about being unselfish. Love is about caring for somebody else. Love is about putting somebody else first. So this might even be a more thorough explanation in Philippians 2, where Paul's explaining, you know, what the love he would like to see in the church there, that they're united because they're not putting themselves first, but they're putting others first. So the regarding others is more important than themselves. I think that's more of the root behind the concept of love. So some theologians uh, drawing from special revelation have tried to explain it like this, two quotes. Millard Erickson again, he argued that since the relationships of the Father and the Son and the Spirit are bound by agape, love, self-sacrificial, giving love, the type of relationship then that should characterize human persons, particularly you know, Christians who have accepted the structure of the intra-Trinitarian relationships as the pattern for their own lives, would be one of unselfish love and submission to the other, seeking the welfare of the other over one's own. I think that's the basic root of love the unselfishness, the putting others first. Clark, Clark argued that no one can reach mature development as a person without the experience of opening oneself, giving oneself to another in self-forgetting love of some kind. You now that's what love is, is putting the other first, forgetting self in a sense. So to be a true self, a true person, one must somehow go out of oneself to forget oneself. And this apparent paradox is an ancient one that has been noted over and over and over again in the various attempts to work out philosophies of love and friendship down the ages. So, bottom line, just to summarize before we move on to the next point, I'm arguing that we're morally good when we resemble the love between the Trinitarian members that we were created to image, we were created to resemble God by loving Him and loving others. And we do that by putting others first. We do that by selflessly focusing on others. And so to be unloving is to be prideful, to be selfish. So that would be an unloving thing to do, to put ourselves first. This is why, just as a, this is a freebie here, this is as a side note, this is why I think it's so helpful and important that Jesus took on a human nature. Because Jesus taking on a human nature really helps us to learn what is morally good. Because he was the perfect example of what it looks like to love others, which resembles the Trinity, within the specific context of human nature. So he's bringing those two facts together. Remember I said, according to my theory, what's morally good is a combination of facts about the loving relationship in the Trinity and facts about the way that God made human nature. And Jesus, one of the divine members, becoming incarnate, taking on human nature, gives us the perfect example of how a human should love humans given that human nature is the way that God created it. So he, gave, he gives us, in his incarnate uh, life, the perfect example of how humans, in particular, can resemble love in the Trinity. I would guess, for example, angels um, would love each other in different ways because they have an angelic nature. But Jesus, you know, becoming incarnate, taking on human nature, shows us perfectly what love looks like in a human context. All right, that was just a side note. Number four. There's two more left. You guys are doing great. I'm arguing that my theory is true because it helps explain uh, the purpose of God's command. Now, this, um, this deals with a very common complaint against 
the theory that God's commands generate our moral obligations. Uh, sometimes people, even Christians, believe or feel maybe that God's commands make morality all about his authority over us, uh, makes morality all about God's desire to control us, almost like a dictator. So they complain any sort of divine command theory, any sort of basing morality on commands whatsoever um, makes morality arbitrary or authoritarian. So I'll give you an example of this. This is from a Christian philosopher, Linda Zagzebski. She's a philosopher at the University of Oklahoma. But here, arguing against divine command theories, the idea that commands should play a part in moral obligation, she complained that making demands is just not a loving thing to do. Brings to mind the idea of a husband demanding that his wife iron his shirt. Most of us think that there's something wrong with the relationship in which such demands are made. Commands are just harsh acts. So sometimes, you know, people have this maybe emotional reaction to uh, divine commands or any sort of theory that brings in divine commands. I heard recently somebody explain it this way. This is their feelings about the situation. They said, you know, look, it seems as though God has, has given us these uncontrollable sexual desires. He's created us, and this person's not a Christian, not a theist as far as I know, but they're making fun of the idea of Christianity. And he says, look, it's kind of like God makes us and gives us these uncontrollable sexual desires, commands us not to indulge in them, and then sits back and kind of laughs at our frustration. And it's the same kind of, you know, complaint that Zagzebski is making here, that these commands just seem arbitrary, they don't seem to serve any purpose. Um, it's just they, they paint a picture of God just trying to control us or exert His authority over us, and that's just not a very loving thing to do. Well, what I'm arguing here is that my Trinitarian moral theory um, explains the purpose of God's commands that they're not arbitrary, that they don't come from some despotic desire to just control our lives. So according to my Trinitarian moral theory, the purpose of God's commands are that they're instructions for the path which best achieves His purpose for us. And again, as I've been saying all night, the purpose that God created us for is to join the fellowship of the Trinity. So the commands He gives us, the instructions He gives us then, are for the purpose of maximizing our ability to be a part of and enjoy these loving relationships, both with Him and with others. Now yes, I affirm we're accountable to God. I affirm that you know, He's our authority. But the purpose of His commands is not about c control and authority. The purpose of His commands is to help us excel at loving relationships, both with Him and with others. And I think this understanding, if it's true, if it's correct description of reality, this understanding then helps us nullify the complaint that God's commands are just arbitrary or that He's just authoritarian like a dictator. But no, if this theory is true, His commands build a relationship of love, communication, and trust between Him and us. In other words, His commands aren't dictatorial but relational, guiding us to our ultimate end, our ultimate purpose to maximize our ability to be a part of and enjoy loving relationships. So one thing we see often from John, both in the Gospel of John and 1 John, is that obeying God is the way that we express our love for Him. So obedience, when we obey His commands, that's how we love Him. That's one way that we can express and love God is through our obedience to Him. 
And I think all of this explains why uh, Jesus said the greatest commands, the greatest two commands, are to love God and love others. And all the other commands are based on this foundation. Loving God and love others is the foundation, and all the other commands God gives are based on that. Because all of His commands are pointing us and instructing us on how to excel at this, loving God and loving others, resembling Him by loving God and loving others. All right, I will give you guys a chance to discuss here for a little bit, and here's your discussion question. So, assuming that my Trinitarian moral theory is true and the purpose of God's commands is to help us be better lovers, love God better, love others better, how does that change your feelings about God's commands? If that's the case, does it give you a different understanding, a different view, if you will, of God's commands? All right, go ahead and discuss that for a few minutes here. Well, I found this understanding to be very helpful because um, I, I think like most people, sometimes will get frustrated at God's commands or I would wonder, you know, what the purpose of them is or just dislike them or um, strain against them. So I often, you know, when I've come to this understanding, because I think it's true, um, I often have to remind myself of these things that, you know, the reason God has commanded X, Y, Z, or the, the reason that God has told me to do or not do X, Y, Z, is because He wants me to enjoy and become a better loving person and enjoy loving relationship with Him and others uh, more and excel in that. And that's the purpose behind His commands. And I have to refine my, re remind myself of that often when my feelings maybe say otherwise. I have to fight against and push against my feelings with these truths. All right, number five, last but not least. I think my theory goes a long way in explaining why there are different types of commands from God. This is gonna take a little bit of fleshing out, but it's our last one and we'll be done. <laughs> so stick with me. Last week we talked a lot about one of the most popular objections to divine command theories is that it makes morality arbitrary. This is the first horn of the Euthyphro Dilemma. So we talked about the Euthyphro Dilemma and how if somebody accepts that first horn, then it makes morality arbitrary and that God could have commanded anything. He could have commanded that rape was good. And so we want to avoid, you know, such a horn. And the way that, that the dilemma is often presented to Christians is that, well, you got to accept that horn or else this other terrible horn that you don't like. And the solution, as we said last week, that's been proposed even possibly all the way back to, to Plato himself, who first wrote about the Euthyphro dilemma, is that this, there's not just two options. There's a third option, and it's that, you know, God's moral nature constrains uh, the commands He gives so that they're not arbitrary. So in that sense, God couldn't command uh, some of those wild, crazy things because, not because of some external constraint on God, we don't want to say that, but an internal constraint on God. For example, God even Himself says in the New Testament that He can't lie because that would violate His moral nature evidently. So his own moral nature places constraints on which commands he can give. Now, as I'm doing with all of my theory, I want to go beyond just God's moral nature and talk specifically about God's Trinitarian moral nature. Because I think bringing the truths of God's Trinitarianness to the table fleshes this out better and paints a, 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 a a more full picture of reality. We can understand reality more when we bring in these Trinitarian truths about God. So, quickly what I'd like to do, and then we'll be done tonight, is 
show you, according to you know, my Trinitarian meta-ethical theory, that there are different types of commands, and when I the difference between them is their different relationship to his Trinitarian moral nature. Now, that sounds long-winded, but I think you'll see the, the benefits of this very quickly. Okay? In other words, what we don't want to say is that all of God's commands are necessitated by his Trinitarian moral nature. We don't want to say that God has to command all the commands that he's commanded because of his moral Trinitarian nature. Some of his commands are like that, but not all of them. And I, and I, I trust you'll understand the importance of making this distinction. So what I'm going to argue is that there's three types of commands. And the difference between them is their different relationship to God's Trinitarian moral nature. So the first type of command is a, is a neutral command. And that really doesn't have any connection to his moral nature. But God has some of those type of commands that he's given us. He also uh, gives us commands that are based more on human nature than on his Trinitarian moral nature. And then the last, uh, maybe the foundational commands, are those which are based on his Trinitarian moral nature. And these would be the ones that are uh, necessary, that God must give uh, because of his Trinitarian moral nature. In other words, he could not command the opposite of these in category C. So I know it, it sounds very abstract and conceptual now, but we'll walk through the three different types and I think you'll understand um, how they can just clarify a lot of understanding of things for us. So let's talk about the first one, neutral commands. Not all of God's commands are necessary given his nature. Some commands have no connection to his Trinitarian moral nature at all. So Baggett and Walls, they have this example, two authors, two Christian authors who write about this issue. They use the example of tithing. They say, look, God could have tithed or, or God could have commanded in the Old Testament for the Israelites to give or tithe 11% instead of 10%. And that wouldn't have violated God's moral nature, right? If he would have commanded them to tithe uh, 20 or 5%, none of those would violate his moral nature, okay? I bring up this hypothetical one about driving on the right side of the road. So God might command, he hasn't as far as I know, but hypothetically you can, you can imagine God commanding a society to drive on the right side of the road. Now there's nothing inherently good or bad about driving on the right side of the road, right? Um, but you could see why God might command that. That would provide standardization to a society. That would probably provide more safety to a society if everybody drove consistently on the right side of the road. So it's not like God wouldn't have good reasons for these commands, but they wouldn't be necessarily tied or connected or necessitated by his moral nature. He could just as easily command maybe another society to drive on the left side of the road. And that wouldn't violate morality. That wouldn't violate his moral nature. That wouldn't create relative morality or cultural morality if God would command different things. Because these type of commands are more neutral. They're not based on his Trinitarian moral nature. And I think this is helpful to understand because I see that a lot of the Old Testament laws are these type of commands. So if you're familiar with the Old Testament law, the God gave them a lot of commands about, for example, certain foods. They couldn't eat pork. They couldn't eat shellfish. They had commands about certain clothes they could and couldn't wear, hairstyles they could and couldn't have, things they had to do to their houses, worship, all these things that inherently don't seem good and bad in and of themselves but yet God commanded them, and so it generated for the Israelites at the time moral obligations. However, when the New Testament comes along, Jesus, and then you know, the New Testament explains that a lot of those commands have been rescinded or changed, or they don't have to follow them anymore. And some people see that, and they're like, oh, God, God can just arbitrarily change morality? 
And some even accuse Christians or Christianity then of affirming relative morality because, see, morality changes. They couldn't do this in the Old Testament, but now you can in the New Testament. But it has, it's more these things that have changed are more neutral type commands. So it'd be, you know, again, silly example, but it'd be like one of those situations where maybe God used to command uh, or command a certain society to drive on the right side of the road, but for whatever reason, he commands another society to drive on the left side of the road. Neither one is good in and of itself. Neither one violates his moral nature. Maybe he has good reasons for commanding two different things, but it doesn't create relative morality. It doesn't create um, uh, violations of his moral nature to do that. So I think it's helpful to think through that some of God's commands are more neutral in this sense. They don't flow from his moral nature. So he could change them and it's, it doesn't violate his Trinitarian moral nature. Now the second type of commands then would be commands which are based on human nature. These would be opposed to the third category we'll talk about, commands that are based on God's nature. These are commands that are based on human nature. They're similar to neutral commands in that they're not connected to God's nature. In other words, they're not necessary given God's nature. But sometimes I think people struggle with this type of command because we might think at first, well, isn't a command against murder necessary? Wouldn't God, because of his moral nature, have to command against murder? And I would just say no. Going back again to the silly example, if God would have created our human nature differently, then commands against murder wouldn't be necessitated or wouldn't apply. So if he made us in such a way that dying felt really good and we came back to life 10 seconds later, then he wouldn't command against it because it would be a loving thing to do. So these commands are not necessitated, necessitated by his nature, but they have more to do with the way he created our nature to be. In other words, because he created human nature to be the way it is, that's what causes him to command these things. Again, this isn't affirming natural law theory. It might be affirming that human nature plays an important role, but it doesn't agree with natural law theory and that I'm not basing all of morality on human nature. So na a natural law theorist would say all of our moral obligations are based on human nature. And I'm just saying some of God's um, commands are, um, are given because of the way he made human nature. So it plays an important role, but human nature is not the core foundation of morality. God's Trinitarian nature is. So I'm arguing. So let's talk about the last one here. So neutral commands, commands that are more based on human nature, and then the last category is commands that are based or necessitated by God's Trinitarian moral nature. And I would make the case that there's only two of them. And it's the two greatest commandments. As Jesus said, the greatest commandments are to love God and to love others. And one of the reasons, quite possibly, that these are the greatest commandments are that these are the only ones that are necessitated by God's moral Trinitarian nature. And they summarize the core foundation of morality, to love God and love others, no matter what our nature is like. So God could have created human nature in all sorts of different ways, and this would still be the case, to love, or to love Him and to love other humans. If you would have created us differently, we would maybe love differently, but the, the loving aspect is what's necessitated. That couldn't be otherwise. So uh, a couple quotes here. This is from Stephen Evans. We've heard from him before. Evans wrote, some of what God commands, he commands necessarily. Not everything. We talked about the other types of commands, but some of 
what he commands, he does so necessarily. And Evans' writing says, I think the most plausible candidates for divine commands that have this character of necessity are the command to love God and the command to love neighbors as ourselves, the two greatest commandments. It might be helpful, just I know this, a lot of this is conceptual, it might be helpful to think about it from the opposite angle, right? What I'm trying to argue is that God could not command us to hate him or to hate others because that would contradict his Trinitarian moral nature. Just like he says of himself that he can't lie, uh, I would make the case that he would not be able to command us to hate him or hate others. So this is what led you know, Alvin Plantinga to write something like this. Alvin Plantinga wrote, it's an essential property of God not to command hate instead of love. Right? Plantinga talks in possible world language. There are no possible worlds in which God commands hate rather than love. But it more, has to do more with his uh, moral nature that he just cannot do that. Now, these two commands, even though they're the greatest, are fairly broad, right? Love God and love others. And I think you can make the case that just by themselves, they don't give much direction. Love God and love others. Hence the need for human nature-based commands, okay? That's why I think understanding these different category of commands is helpful because they complement each other, okay? Even though this category C, commands based on God's Trinitarian moral nature, even though those are the only necessary commands, those other ones are very useful in that they complement these. In other words, the human nature-based commands tell us how to love, given that human nature is the way it is. So the human nature-based commands tell us how to love, and if you think about it, it makes sense. You know, how we love a being or how we love a particular being depends on what that being is like. That's why I said before, you know, angelic beings might love each other in different ways than we do. They're still supposed to love, but because they're different beings, expressing their love to one another, doing loving things, might look differently because they have different natures than us. So, if love is, as we defined it tonight, an unselfish care for others, God created human nature in such a way that certain things that we do are loving and other things that we do are unloving and selfish. I know I talk too abstractly, so let me bring this down to just a a more a concrete example, okay? Just take sex for a second. So God created us as human beings to be sexual beings. Angels aren't, but part of our nature is to be sexual beings, male and female, and then to enter into sexual relationships with each other. So he created human nature in such a way, one way is to be sexual, but because of, he created us that way, um, sex in the form of a faithful marriage is a loving and unselfish thing to do. But because of the way he created us, sex in the form of rape or adultery is an unloving and selfish thing to do. So again, it's not the, the acts, because God could have created us differently, but it's the loving aspect or the unloving aspect of it, given the way he created us, that can either reflect him or not reflect him. So, again, these two types of commands are complementary. Last quote for the evening, I believe. This is from John Hare, summarizing better than I did what I'm trying to get across here. So John Hare said, The commandments that tell us to love the greatest commandments, the ones that I'm calling necessary commandments, the commandments that tell us to love have a different kind of necessity than the commandments that tell us how to love. 
Again, he's drawing on Dun Scotus here. Scotus is not saying that the love of the neighbor is contingently commanded, but that the form in which this love is to be shown is contingent. In other words, he could have commanded uh, differently if he would have created human nature differently. It's contingent in that sense. So the necessary commands to love God and love others provide the broad direction, and then the human nature-based commands tell us exactly how to be loving, given the way that he's created human nature to be the way it is. The human nature-based commands are important, and they have an important role to play, but they're not necessary uh, based on his nature, because he could have made us with a different human nature. So to summarize, these are the three commands. I'm making a case that there's three different types of commands. Neutral commands, talked about those examples. Commands that are based more on human nature. And then the ultimate commands, which all the other commands are built on this ultimate foundation of loving God and loving others. So that's my theory in a nutshell. That's what I've tried to uh, work through as I've you know, read these other theories, a lot of divine command theories, a lot of natural law theories, to try to affirm some of the things that I think they got correct and add to where I think they were missing and but pulling on things from special revelation, previous theologians who have come before me, philosophers wrestling with these issues. I've tried to build a meta-ethical theory that describes reality. That's my goal here. I want to try to understand what really is true. But like with any theory, you know, we're proposing things. We could get it wrong. Even scientific theories are proposed. Maybe they get some things right, some things wrong, but then the conversation keeps going and they flesh out, others come along and flesh out the theories and discover more accurately what's right or what's wrong. I think of Isaac Newton a lot in this context. Isaac Newton had some great theories and uh, they've helped us understand reality better. Um, but then as science progressed, we learned that, well, some things uh, Newton actually had wrong, and we can get more fine-tuned in our understanding of reality. But he did hit on some correct things in his theory as well. And that's what we try to do in philosophy and theology as well. We, we're trying to understand reality, understand what's really true, and, but we make mistakes. We do our best. We're finite. We don't know anything with absolute certainty, so I would argue. But we stumble through it and we try to understand what's true as best we can. So there's my theory in a nutshell. Maybe that wasn't quite a nutshell. A few nutshells. But it's been a very enjoyable exercise the last few years to try to think through all these things and try to understand God and how He created us and what morality is all about. So. Let me open it up to you guys for any questions for the night.